All right, it is time to film our very first video here in the new set. Man, it feels so nice to have this set just ready to go at any time. I just turn on the camera lights and just oh, gorgeous, beautiful. <laughs> it's just been something I've been trying to do forever. Like a year ago, I was saying, what if I just got a big old TV? Like I see them for like a thousand bucks at Costco and I just mount it back there. And depending on what kind of background I feel like, I just load an image and put it back there. And my plan was to follow that up like maybe a month or two afterwards with this build out but here we are like a year after and finally but anyways today i'm going to be trying to answer the question i get asked all the time which is what camera should i buy and it's actually a pretty tough question to answer because there's so many different variables and features and things you might be looking for in a camera depending on how you plan on using it it's kind of like asking what kind of car should i buy well maybe the perfect car for you is the toyota prius you know very good fuel efficiency or maybe you're trying to do burnouts to impress the girl next door then maybe you want something with real wheel drive action maybe a challenger v8 take off that traction control do donuts and then get a fire post and you're in trouble <laughs> so before I can answer your questions, I'm going to have to ask you questions first. Is your phone good enough? I mean, it's a serious consideration now. I don't want you to go out and spend a thousand dollars on a camera and realize that your phone is better. And you're like, why the f definitely helps to think about some specifics on why you want something different. Maybe you want to have something that's wearable. Maybe you're trying to get some really unique angles and perspectives out of a 360 camera. Maybe you're just trying to get your footage to look more professional, or maybe you are professional and have professional requirements like time code and XLR inputs and all that crap. Next question is how important is your autofocus? To be more specific, autofocus in video, because for me, it is a very high priority. I'm filming myself with a fast F 2.0 lens. So, you know, uh, I'm sorry, but maybe you're more of a cinematographer and you pull your own focus on manual vintage lenses or anamorphics or whatever, then obviously that's going to open a lot of doors and options to what kind of cameras you can have if you don't need really good video autofocus. Are you willing to color grade? Because if yes, you can really maximize the performance out of a lot of these cameras with dynamic range and color. But if you're just like, nope, not gonna do that. I'm just gonna download the memory card and go straight up to YouTube and I want it to look good. Then there's certain features you don't really need like 10 bit log. Also, what kind of zoom do you need? Do you need something really wide for landscapes or to be able to vlog and film yourself? Or are you looking for telephoto so you can do some bird photography? Do you need good image stabilization in the camera? So obviously if you're on a tripod, like I am right now, it doesn't really matter. But if you plan on holding a camera like this and your hands are kind of shaking, you're on a tight angle lens, the stabilization that's built into the camera can really help you out. Also, do you plan on recording a lot of long clips like interviews or events where you're just gonna plant the camera and let it roll? That's important to think about because some cameras overheat if you let it run for a long time and also some cameras have a record time limit. Other things to think about is do you need slow motion? What kind of lighting conditions are you gonna be filming in? Are you gonna be in a space like this where the lighting is very controlled in a studio and even, or are you gonna be filming in the dark a lot? Do you need good low light performance? Or are you going to be filming in the sun where you need a lot of dynamic range? Do you have plans on filming video like this and then repurposing it for social media for that vertical video? What are your plans for recording audio? Do you have any size and weight requirements for your camera? Do you plan on sending your video to an external monitor like I am right now? And of course, what is your budget? And definitely keep in mind that if you see a camera like this a 7 4 which is around 2,500 bucks, you definitely want to make sure you leave room in that budget for the lens, extra battery, batteries, memory cards, microphones, lights, all adds up. So if you're still watching this video, be prepared to be broke. But you know how you can save some money is with our sponsor, Storyblocks. Like, you know how much effort it was to just get this simple shot back here? I was on a roof for hours cold. Instead, I could have just gone to Storyblocks and just typed in landscape. And first option, look at the gorgeous 4K. Yes, please. Now we are in Norway. You know, I've always wanted to go to space. And now welcome to the YouTube studio on the International Space space station. Dylan, what the hell are you doing out there? Storyblocks makes it easy and affordable to access over a million stock assets, which includes 4K videos, images, sound effects, music, even graphic templates. This is LA, it doesn't snow here. Do you know how long the flight from LA to Bali is? It's too long. You get comprehensive royalty-free licensing, so you don't have to stress out about if you could use it for this video, but not that video or that video, or how many times can you use it? And now if you're new to editing, there's Maker, which is an easy to use editor that's built in. And now there's even a plugin for Adobe Premiere so you could search the asset and load it straight into your Premiere project. So thank you so much to Storyblocks for sponsoring this episode. Links down there in the description if you're interested in trying them out. And how do I get back home? I feel like I'm in a video game. Oh, there's a bird that flew by. All right, so we've made it back to Los Angeles and hopefully by now you've had a chance to think about what you're looking for specifically in your camera. So let's just go through these questions. So is your phone good enough? Because these cameras on these phones have gotten so good lately that if you have an outdated phone and you want to spend $500, 
$500 on a camera. So it's probably best to just spend that $500 upgrading your phone. And I would definitely say having three lenses helps because then you get your ultra wide, your wide and your telephoto lenses. A few years ago, I might've recommended a point and shoot camera because they fit in your pocket and give you access to like a one inch sensor and some good zoom lenses. But now I'm just not seeing a big enough performance leap from a phone to one of those in order to justify having another thing to keep track of memory cards and batteries to charge. You still get a better sensor out of those, but phones have gotten really smart with their algorithms from the HDR to image stabilization. But there's still interesting things in the $500 price range like action cameras, you know, a GoPro, you can mount those and take those to places you normally wouldn't with a phone. But then there's cameras like the Action 3, which has similar features, but priced less. So definitely a good budget option there. I've done a video comparing the two before, and there's also the DJI Action 2, which I thought was pretty innovative on how it comes apart. If you're looking for the smallest camera, there's the Insta360 Go, which is just ridiculously tiny and somehow it still delivers a decent image. And speaking of Insta360, if there's one action camera that I keep in my bag, it's the Insta360 X3. It is a 360 camera, so it's different technology where it records everything and then you can pull different shots out of it. But if you're trying to film yourself doing something like snowboarding, there is nothing else that can get these types of shots. Uh. Sorry, I've been burping so much. I've been drinking a lot of this sparkly water because I'm trying to cut down on beer and I just need something kind of fun. Now, if you really want to step up the image quality to something better, then you need a bigger, better sensor and some right lenses to go along with that. So that's when mirrorless cameras come in. You start getting a shallower depth of field, meaning that I'm in focus, but the background is blurry. You know, with an action camera, you're dealing with a smaller sensor, which means more of the shot is going to be in focus. So you don't really have to worry as much about autofocus there. But here I need really good autofocus. And that is the biggest reason why I use Sony because they just seem to have the best autofocus in video. I just have a lot of trust in the Sony autofocus system, but the Panasonic S5 II that just came out, they just switched over to phase detect autofocus technology, which is the same tech that Sony uses. And they are still improving it, but I would say that they are doing a killer job with that camera. So I would say that is a great option as well. Now, when I talk about Panasonic, keep in mind that I'm talking specifically about the Panasonic S5 too, because before that they were using contrast-based autofocus. So you could find some issues there, which is kind of meh, like it works, but if you're relying on it heavily, like I am, it's just safer to go with something that has really good autofocus. So from my experiences, Canon's dual pixel autofocus is good. Panasonic's phase detect autofocus in the S5 II is great. And I would say Sony's phase detect autofocus the best. And of course I'm talking about video autofocus. Everyone seems to do a pretty good job in photo autofocus these days but when it comes to video autofocus like you're looking at right now when i move in and out but if you can live without the best autofocus then it really opens some doors also this year i do want to check out nikon and fujifilm because i hear they're putting in some serious work there but i personally have not had a chance to check that out just yet if we go to our next question do you plan on color grading so if your answer is i will not be color grading then there's a lot of features like 10 bit and log profiles and those things are something you don't really need and actually can drive the price down on a camera if you're not looking for that. But you can get so much more out of your footage if you are willing to even just do the bare minimum requirements of color grading. That's just simply finding the right LUT to apply to your footage. Let's say a cloud rolls in and your exposure changes throughout a shot. You have just so much more leeway to correct for that. But if you shoot in those flat profiles at 8-bit, it's just not enough information. It can break the image apart. So 10-bit just has a lot more information and density in terms of the color information. So when you expand it back out, it looks great. And 10-bit color really used to be a feature that was reserved for the professional cameras. But over the last two years, we've really seen that 10-bit color come down into the mirrorless cameras. And what was really exciting about like the last six months is we really started to see 10-bit entering not the high-end mirrorless camera, but even like the mid-tier to low-cost ones, like the $1,500 Canon R7. Really impressive camera. It is a crop sensor, but they all also just announced the Canon R8. Super excited to test this one out because it is full frame, but still has 10-bit C-Log3 for $1,500. And again, if you're not planning on color grading, then there's the Canon R50, which was also announced. Definitely gonna be testing this one out because when I started out this YouTube channel, I was shooting on the Canon M50. And this seems just like a modern updated version of it. And this thing comfortably shoots 4K. So at this point, if you plan on buying a camera today, it should be able to at least shoot in 4K. Also, how much zoom do you need? And this is where 
we start really looking at beyond the camera bodies and the ecosystem of lenses. For example, my Sony a7 IV is a full frame E mount. So my go-to lenses are the 16 to 35 F4 for vlogging because it's a nice wide angle. Also the Tamron 35 to 150 F2 to F2.8, which is really an outstanding lens. And if I've got the room, I'll sprinkle in some fast prime lenses and I've got this 24 to 240, which has some really great range, but not super fast. And if you're on the Canon RF system, you have options like this 28 to 70 F2. It's actually not uncommon to pick out your lenses first and basing your camera bodies based on the lenses. If you have an iPhone around, you can go ahead and just zoom and you can actually see what a 24 mil looks like. And then out wider, 13 mil, which is actually insanely wide. And then what a 48 mil looks like and a 77. Based on this, you can kind of get an idea of what focal length you're looking for. And then also, if you are not using a full frame sensor, like an APS-C or Super 35, that has a crop factor of maybe 1.5 or 1.6. And then a micro four thirds out of like a Panasonic G86 is gonna be a 2X. So you gotta just make sure you do the math on that. So a 16 mil on a 2X crop, like a Panasonic micro four thirds is gonna be more like a 32 mil equivalent. Now, if you have some shaky hands, the tighter that lens is, the more telephoto it is, the more you're gonna see that shake come through. Best way to stabilize a camera, probably a tripod, right? Start there, there's a gimbal, there's sliders, but within the camera itself, there's a few forms of stabilization that's built into the camera. So the most common being digital image stabilization. Our mirrorless cameras have it, our action cameras have it, and the king of digital image stabilization is probably GoPro. So the image that gets recorded on the sensor is actually really shaky, but then it gets processed afterwards to look smooth. But you definitely need a good fast shutter speed, meaning on an action camera, a lot of light. Once it gets darker, it's not gonna look as good, but these action cameras and Panasonic and Sony have a little gyro sensor in the camera. So the processor references that gyro data and stabilizes the image afterwards. Now Canon also has digital image stabilization, but they tend to analyze the image instead of referencing a gyro sensor. So sometimes it could track the wrong subject. So the camera could look like it's moving even if it's on a tripod. Now there's some cameras where you could record unstabilized, but then it records the gyro data. So then you can go in and stabilize it in post-processing software afterwards. So there's GoPro's Real Steady and Sony's Catalyst Browse, and also cameras like the Red Komodo and Blackmagic Pocket cameras. They're getting firmware updates to where that also gets recorded. So that's actually a really cool option that we're starting to see more of. But there's also optical image stabilization with the lens. You might see IS for image stabilization or OSS for optical steady shot. Now this is the Sony a7 IV. It's my personal daily driver right here. I have a 16 to 35 f4 lens on here. The reason why I go for the f4, which may not be as fast as the f2.8, is because there's optical image stabilization in the lens. Lens. Now with the Panasonic S5 II, the IBIS on here is so good that I feel comfortable using non-stabilized lenses on here. That is where you actually have the sensor that's in here and it kind of wobbles around. So I would say Panasonic is kind of the best at IBIS right now because it's really good at stabilizing your tight angle lenses, but also when you pull back out to a wide angle, it still looks pretty good even if you're vlogging and moving around a lot. My Sony a7 IV and a7S III both have IBIS, but it's not as strong, meaning sometimes I can't even tell if I have it on or not. And then there's Canon that has really strong IBIS. It's amazing how stable a lot of your photos and videos will come out. But the downside is when you're on an ultra wide angle lens, you could see the warpiness, the IBIS wobble. So there's cameras like the entry level R8, which does not have IBIS, but also on the high end, the Canon R5C, which is a cinema focused mirrorless camera, does not have IBIS because generally high end professional cinema cameras, they would rather just stabilize the entire camera like with a gimbal. My go-to gimbal is the DJI RS3. And if I plan on setting it up with a bigger camera and rigging it out with different accessories, then the RS3 Pro is definitely nice to have that extra payload capacity and space. If you're looking for something lower in cost, smaller in size and less in weight, then there's the RS3 Mini. It has no problems with full frame cameras with a heavy 24 to 70 F2.8. Perfect option for maybe a traveler or a solo shooter. But one of the features I love about the RS3 and the RS3 Pro is that you can tap to lock all access because it just saves so much time. It's not a hard thing to do, but it's one of those things that you have to do very, very often. So it just makes it that much more of a pleasant experience. Now, what's nice about something like a drone is that it has a gimbal built into the aircraft, which is why you can fly it around and it still looks like a nice stable shot. For myself, I would definitely go for DJI Mini 3 Pro. It's a good balance of performance, but being affordable and small in size. But of course you can go up or down from there, depending on what your needs are. But Mini 3 Pro, solid, solid with a little controller with the screen on. Of course, you could always take your phone and stabilize that with a gimbal. So you're relying less on the digital image stabilization and more on the actual camera 
camera being stabilized. Now, the next thing to think about is how long will you need the camera to record for in one go? And there are certain cameras that have a record time limit. So you definitely want to make sure you know about that, especially in older cameras, 30 minutes. Sometimes it's in an hour. Luckily with the a7 IV, I don't have to worry about it. So I can just let it roll forever. But one thing to also watch out for is overheating. Generally, most consumer cameras have a operational limit of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius. So I try to test the cameras in that temperature to see how long it takes before it shuts off. But let's say you film in really hot places and you do not want to risk it overheating and shutting down on you. You know, something with a fan like the Sony FX3 or a Canon C70 has a fan. Panasonic actually even has a fan. This camera angle right here is actually the Sony A7S III, basically like the same sensor as the Sony FX3, which has more video focused features, which I probably would have gotten the FX3, but this came out first. Even though I'm using the a7 IV more often, what's really nice about the a7S III is that it has really good slow motion. So it has 4K at 120 frames per second and full HD at 240 frames per second and more frames per second that it records, the more you can spread it out over a longer period of time and have super slow motion. Action cameras like GoPros have really good slow-mo these days. A lot of the mid-tier mirrorless cameras like this a7 IV seems to be a little bit limited there. Like this can do 4K 60, but even at 60 frames per second, it is gonna have a crop. And the Panasonic S5 II can do some pretty high frame rates, but at a point you start losing the autofocus capability. But overall to get really good slow motion, you're gonna have to get something that has high frame rates and still hopefully maintain a good resolution without too much of a crop. Or you can just get absolutely crazy with the Phantom camera and just shoot like 10,000 frames per second. And then there's also like the Kronos camera that we tested out that one time. If you're trying to get crazy slow motion, then you definitely have to go into specialty slow-mo cameras. FreeFly just announced this camera called the Ember. It looks really interesting because the picture quality looks actually really good. It shoots super slow-mo, but it does start at $18,000. So you might be thinking, holy crap, that's a lot of money. Or you might be thinking, well, a Phantom is easily 150K. So this is something in the bargain bin. It's all kind of perspective, but even iPhones, HD at 240 frames per second. Hey, this is actually the same slow-mo capability as like the A7S III. But of course, it's gonna look way better when you shoot it on a proper mirrorless camera. Now moving on to lighting conditions. Right now we're filming in a studio space that's fairly controlled and I get to balance everything. I bet if I just started recording on my phone right now, it still looks decent because of the even lighting. But let's say you get into some high dynamic range lighting. Like let's say there's a sun, very bright blasting onto one part of the shot, but then you have some action taking place where it's darker, big differences in exposure there. So a lot of dynamic range will really help you out. Like the Arri Alexa 35 is the craziest dynamic range I have ever seen. So if you have about $100,000 to put into a camera, then that's gonna give you excellent dynamic range. And this is where I would need to give a shout out to the Canon C70, where they have really good dynamic range in a fairly small body. But even down here in the mirrorless world, by shooting log with 10 bit, you still have a lot more access to dynamic range because then when you shoot in 8-bit without log, then you're really clipping your shadows and highlights. And once those are gone, you can't really recover them. And then what if you have just no lighting? You're in the dark. Again, that's where Sony really excels with their low light, but Panasonic S5 II has also been really good. And I will say the main reason I am filming with the a7 IV more often than the a7S III is because dual native ISO. So the a7S III hits its higher base at 12,800 ISO, which is very high up there, but once you get to that point, the image gets clean again, which is nice because in a really dark place, it looks good. But the downside is that you don't hit that second base until you get all the way up there. Sometimes I'm just like trying to get to 4,000 or 6,400 ISO maybe, and it just doesn't look that good on the a7S III, but on the a7 IV, that higher base just comes in much earlier and same with the Panasonic and Canons. So in that 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 territory, these actually look better. But also lenses are a big factor in exposure more than I think a lot of people realize a stop of exposure is basically doubling the light. So every time you go from 400 to 800, that's one stop 800 ISO to 1600. That's another stop 3200 another stop, right? Doubles. Now with lenses, exposure comes in through F stops or T stops, right? We have F4, F16, F11, F2.8. The difference between an F1.4 prime lens and an F4 zoom lens, like I have right here is actually three stops because 
F1.4 to F2 is a stop, 2.8, and then again, 2.8 to F4. I could drive that ISO down from 6,400 to 800 and still maintain the same exposure. So if one of the things you're really looking for is being able to film at night and not have it look grainy, first of all, you want something that has good high ISO performance, possibly a dual native ISO, so it jumps to that higher base, and also a fast lens. It's obviously huge demand for vertical videos these days, but we don't wanna shoot vertical, right? So you might have to take a wide angle shot like this and crop it in to get that vertical video. Now that is one of the things that's really nice about this Panasonic S5 II is that it has a open gate setting. So basically it gives us a more square image. And so that's basically aspect ratio, basically the shape of the video that you're creating. So Sony's we're here stuck at 16 by nine, which is fine. That's most common but the new gopros have a very tall aspect ratio specifically for that purpose of being able to extract a wide angle as well as a vertical video very easily and also don't forget that audio is half of video so if i wasn't recording into this microphone right now you would just be listening to the onboard microphone on that camera and this sounds pretty terrible right so let's get back to this microphone right here for these kinds of cameras the most common type of mic input is probably a 3.5 mil mic input and also really useful to have a head headphone jack so that you can monitor the audio with headphones and just make sure that the sound that's coming in and being recorded sounds good. Now, more professional microphones like this one here has a three pin XLR cable, which you can adapt onto certain cameras with like a top handle adapter on the FX3 or even the FX30, Panasonic or Canon R5C that will allow you to adapt XLR input straight into the camera. Or what I do is record into this external recorder. This is a Zoom F3. This can record two channels channels of three pin XLR. But what makes this really cool is that it can record something called 32 bit flow. Usually when you're recording audio, you have to dial in those levels to make sure you're not recording too loud or too quiet or else you're gonna have problems. But 32 bit flow, you don't even adjust the levels on it. It just records all of it. We're starting to see some really good microphone systems come out for 3.5 mil, which is nice because not all of us wanna adapt big microphone with XLR inputs. Big fan of the DJI mics. It's a little wireless mic right here that I can just clip on. Really gave me a lot more flexibility on how close I have to be to the camera to record good audio. And I could just take a few and put it on a couple different people. And it's just like really convenient. Aside from the mic jack, it definitely is useful to know what kind of video out options you have out of the camera. So HDMI, this is a full size, which is nice. Now there are some tiny micro HDMIs, which is very easy to break. And there's a lot of cameras where if you plug in an HDMI into the camera, then you no longer get the display back here. Also notice that I have an ND photo filter on here, basically sunglasses for your camera for when it's bright. I use these magnetic ones from Freewell so I can quick swap them. There are also variable NDs so you could dial in the strength, but I personally like just the single strength ones because they don't have any issues with polarizers. And also what's nice about this size is that it usually doesn't get in the way of a lens hood and this can help keep glare out of the lens. So these are the Freewell magnetic filters. I've been using them for like the last couple of years, unless the camera has built in internal NDs, which is so nice. The Sony FX6 and the FX9 have this really cool variable ND filter that's electronic. So you don't have the polarizer issues, but you can still dial in the strength exactly. And of course, when it comes to those pro cameras, then you're dealing with bigger cameras with size and heavier cameras with weight. Oh, right. And yeah, people generally like to take photos. I'm clearly not a, a photo person. I'm much more of a video person, but yeah, like a lot of these cameras can also take incredible photos as well. Like that's another thing that's nice about the a7 IV is it has more megapixels for photo. That's nice. The a7S III, I think is 12 megapixels. So still solid. Like I rarely need more than 12 megapixels, but if you like doing bigger prints and stuff like that, maybe like a 32 megapixel or 50 megapixel or hundred. And of course the final question, the budget at 679, I think the Canon R50 is going to be the new standard for what a camera in this price range is going to be capable of doing. If you want that 10 bit color for that color grading capability, there's the crop censored R7 with IBIS and also the full frame R8. Canon's always done a great job bringing some really good features down to this price range good Canon colors and their menu system is really clean and easy to understand. You know, for example, Sony can be a little bit more complicated and it takes more time to learn it. A little bit past that to the two to 2.5K category, we start really getting a lot of the bells and whistles. So Panasonic S5 II really gives us some video centric tools as well as their great stabilization and 6K open gate. The Sony a7 IV gives us that Sony technology that tried and true autofocus, but also really high end codecs, which just pack in more information. But of course, this is all based off my 
my needs the whole point of this is that you can make up your own mind on what you're looking for like if you want that super slow-mo then the sony fx3 would be worth looking at let's say you don't care about autofocus then there's the black magic pocket 4k for 1300 you can get really high quality raw footage if you're always shooting on a gimbal there's the ronin 4d or the canon c70 has really good dynamic range fx9 is a great full frame sensor with that great electronic nd filter you're gonna want to make sure that you leave room for the lenses you know i would definitely say decent body with great lenses is better than great body with whatever lenses let's go ahead and read some comments from the last video where i kind of did a breakdown of how i set this whole space up steven says why is everything so expensive at this point i'm thinking of filming my videos with an iphone yeah so going back to question number one is your iPhone good enough? Network Chuck, dude, set is amazing. Thank you. This is incredible. I I'm glad that you guys like the set. I'm still kind of tempted to move this table back to the original location for that profile view, but this just feels so much more natural when I don't have to turn my body and lean into the microphone. So I don't know, it's a trade-off. Lost LeBlanc says, insane, man. I'd say come back to Bali, but now you can visit from your office. Thanks, Christian. And as awesome as it does look on the shot, when I do just like look back there, it I'm not fooled at all that that's real. Like it just straight up looks just like TVs there, but it's kind of cool where when you film it, it can actually kind of look like a window. <laughs> Brandon says, this is so freaking cool. I love it. I record everything in my tiny room. So this was just amazing to watch. Uh, thanks. That is one of the struggles is trying to make a small room look big. First couple people that came and visited here, they all said the same thing. They're like, huh, it's smaller in here than I thought. But the perception that you can create with different focal length with your lenses have a big play in that. So it's fun to experiment and really just put that into practice here. But anyways, oh my God, this is such a long video now. So I'm going to go now see you later go ahead and feel free to click on stuff if that's what you wish and thank you so much for watching i'm gonna go eat vegetables i'm losing weight guys i'm getting more in shape i'll show you am i gonna get demonetized for this maybe but i just want to show you where i'm at now you know it's getting rid of it